Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're taking a look at a light-barreled Israeli FAL. This is actually a pretty scarce version of the FAL in the United States. Uh, for a couple factors. Uh, for one thing, only a very small number of these were imported as semi-auto rifles before the 1989 import ban cut them off in the US. Um, there weren't all that many of them actually ordered and produced in the first place, certainly compared to some of the major European countries. Uh, production and, and purchase of FAL rifles. Um, what's kind of interesting, Israel produced or uh, used both the light barrel infantry rifle and also the heavy barrel light automatic rifle version of the FAL. And between the two, actually, the heavy barreled ones are substantially more common in the United States because those parts kits came into the United States and have been built up into complete rifles by a number of different people. Now, that's what this gun actually is. This is one that DSA has. Uh, produced just recently using a new manufactured barrel and receiver of their own, and then a whole set of original Israeli parts. They were able to get a batch of these parts kits into the US, which is really cool because, well, for a couple reasons. So, first off, um, the Israelis were one of the very first countries to actually adopt and actually use the FAL. The very first country was Canada, and I have a video coming on some of the very early Canadian rifles, but uh, the Israelis adopted this before most of NATO did. Um, in 1955 this was adopted by Israel. Uh, this is also within just a very short time of the 7.62 NATO cartridge actually being adopted or being formalized and finalized by NATO. And the Israelis had these things in 7.62 NATO before much of NATO had them. So Germany, for example, would not adopt this as the G1 rifle uh, until the early 1960s, you know, several years after the Israelis had them. And this is interesting to me, both from a historical perspective, but also from a mechanical perspective. As more and more countries adopted the FAL, its features would shift and change. And so the Israeli gun is actually a very interesting example of a really quite early production style of FAL. Now that's been combined with a number of Israeli modifications. So the way this worked is the first rifles that Israel, Israel used, they purchased straight out from FN. And then over time they started manufacturing their own parts. Israel never would produce a complete FAL rifle of its own. Um, it would always use uh, receivers imported from, uh, from FN in Belgium, but virtually every other part eventually the Israelis would produce. And so this rifle uh, is kind of a hybrid of some Israeli and some FN. Um, it is notable for having a bare muzzle, we'll talk about that in a moment. That would change over time. The Israelis would, as they continued to purchase and build rifles, they would start to adopt some of the changes that were being made by FN for the rest of the world market. At any rate, um, aside from just the, the mechanical production features. This of course was also one of the, Israel was one of the first countries to actually use the FAL. Uh, it's, the, the FAL has this uh, colloquial name of the, the right arm of the free world because so many NATO countries adopted it. However, a lot of them didn't put it into much use. There never was you know, a, a big land battle World War III where the AK faced off against the FAL you know, with Russian tanks coming through to fill the gap. Instead, much of the use of the foul in combat was in small-scale brush wars. Of course, uh, the, the fight over the Falklands Islands, the Malvinas, uh, is a, a great example of actually both sides using the foul. But Israel was actually using these within a year of formally adopting them. They had them in the Suez Crisis, and then they would be the standard Israeli frontline infantry rifle for the Six Day War in 1967 and they would continue in service all the way through uh, 1973 Yom Kippur War, where they were again the standard frontline infantry weapon. So let me go ahead and show you what makes this a little bit unique among other fouls, and then we'll talk about what ended up happening to the foul in Israel. This example is one of the rifles that's being built by DSA and that they've just released onto the market. And one of the really cool things that they did on these is they put their legally required markings here, their manufacturer name and serial number, on the inside of the magazine well. What that means is that they can go ahead and engrave whatever they want here on the upper receiver, on the outside, where the original factory markings would have been. Now on a foul in the United States it's this upper receiver component that is the, the legal firearm part of the gun, which means because these rifles were originally select fire they are considered machine guns, 
and the upper receivers had to be destroyed as part of the import process. So DSA made their own upper receivers, and then they just copied exactly the original Israeli markings. So if we take a look at that uh, up close, what that actually translates to is uh, self-loading rifle FN 762. Remember that Hebrew is read uh, right to left, so uh, self-loading rifle FN 762. And then uh, the bottom line basically says model 1A. There are a couple different models. Um, in particular, the heavy barreled uh, light, light automatic rifle version or light machine gun version will have a different line below here with a, a different model number or model designation. And then of course there is uh, the IDF logo. There are a couple different versions of that depending on the early or late uh, style of the rifles. The Israeli fire selector is also a little bit different than the standard. Um, it is full auto here, safe there, and semi-automatic here. Now you can see there's a tab there that actually prevents you from pushing the selector switch over to full auto. Uh, of course this, as a modern semi-auto production rifle, does not have the internal parts required for full auto fire. You can't just grind that off and then have a full auto rifle. Uh, but what the Israelis discovered in service is, while these guns were originally issued as select fire rifles, uh, fully automatic fire from a foul from the shoulder is a completely worthless waste of ammunition. And so they uh, put together this different, uh, re basically revised selector switch that didn't allow the rifle to go into full auto. Um, and yes, I know there are going to be people in the comments who are going to scoff and say, well, I would have just cut that off. Well, no you wouldn't have if you were in the Israeli military and uh, your sergeant caught you doing that. So uh, this was a part added by the Israelis. Uh, it's interesting to note that this sort of modification was not uncommon with countries that issued the FAL. Uh, Great Britain, for example, uh, their L1A1 rifles, they quickly got rid of the full auto capability um, when the Brits went into the Falklands. The British FALs were in fact semi-auto only rifles as well. The rear sight is an aperture with adjustments out to 600 meters. So the basic there is two, we have three, four, five, and 600, uh, and it slides up this angled block, so as you slide it forward it, it raises up. And this is the early tall style of sight. As I said at the beginning, this is indicative of very early FN production style. Now not every bit of it is. This is a later style of stock that has a metal cap on it, uh, and this is because the Israelis would go back and retrofit some of, their, some of the features of these guns. But the sights are all the early tall style. And in fact the Israelis developed their own uh, gas block here that has these very hefty protective sort of hexagonal protective wings. That's a distinctly Israeli element. Um, you'll notice there are Israeli markings on a bunch of these parts, because these are all XIDF uh, rifle parts. Anyway, um, some of the Israeli rifles will have a, a sort of a lighter, smoother um, front sight protector with lightning holes in it. That's the FN style. Probably the most distinctive part of the whole rifle is this front handguard with basically half wood and half sheet metal. When Israel started buying these guns, the very first ones had a full length wooden handguard, uh, basically on the same pattern as the American T-48 Trials FAL. Um, that was a very early FN standard. Well those handguards were actually a little bit fragile up front, the wood up here was thinner than the wood back here, and the Israelis would start producing their own handguards with a metal section up front uh, and a hefty wood piece back here. Note that, interestingly, kind of like actually like the FG42, there is a piece of corrugated sheet steel uh, that has been pressed into the front and back of the handguards. That helps protect them from cracking, uh, strengthens up the, the wood there. Another early foul element is the folding carry handle. That was popular um, at first with a lot of countries and then generally was discarded over time, um, but the Israelis had them on all of their guns. And one other distinctively Israeli modification is that these rifles actually have uh, a forward assist capable charging handle. So as with all fouls, the bolt handle here is non-reciprocating. So let's see, let me go ahead and lock the bolt open. So once the bolt's locked open, this slides free, we can lock it back into place there. However, if the bolt comes part way forward and you want to force it the rest of the way forward, all you have to do is push the charging handle in, and that will engage with the, the plug here, will engage with a hole in the bolt carrier. 
you can see the element that uh, pushes the bolt forward, when I push the handle in, it pushes into the receiver right there, and that is going to interface right back here, and allow you to push the bolt forward uh, with the bolt handle. That's a feature that you will not find on standard FN fouls. Those of you who are familiar with foul development will know that this is not an early takedown lever. Originally, well, let me just show you this, to, to break the upper and lower apart you push this lever up, which allows the two to separate. There's a catch right there, goes backward, it locks into the upper receiver here. On the early, the very original fouls, this was actually a vertical lever back here that you would push backward and it would pull that lug back. The problem was they found that on, on recoil, especially recoil uh, from firing rifle grenades, uh, that would actually bounce backwards, and it could let the gun open up when it wasn't supposed to. Well, if you put the lever down here and, and have it operate by pushing it upward, recoil is not going to have any impact on that, and so this was a superior design. Now the early Israeli rifles did have vertical takedown levers, those were replaced over time uh, on probably most of them uh, in service in the IDF. Now this is what you would call a metric pattern foul, that's kind of a a blanket term that's used to differentiate between FN production and British uh, Commonwealth production. Uh, if you're not a, a foul devotee, the main upshot of that is that this uses metric style of uh, magazines. The inch pattern, the British Commonwealth magazines, have a much larger front locking lug that's milled. When you see them both they're quite easy to distinguish. Um, as of the time of this filming, the metric mags are actually the easier ones to obtain, so that's kind of nice. They are 20 rounds of course, they're 762 NATO. These are Israeli marked, let's see, yeah, there it is, a little Israeli property stamp there. And they are of course a rock in, nose in, rock back style of magazine. Now the last thing I want to talk about here is the muzzle and the bayonet lug. Uh, again, early pattern foul, it has a bare muzzle, it's not threaded does not take a muzzle device. That would change over time. Uh, around the early 1960s FN would develop what they what's generally called a combination muzzle device, which allows the rifle to fire rifle grenades. It also acts as a muzzle brake, um, a compensator, and it's, yeah, it's about yay long and about an inch in diameter. Uh, the Israelis would start to use those later on, um, and some of their barrels would be retrofitted, so you'll see some, including some that DSA is selling, that have a, this barrel with this weird bayonet lug that we'll get to in a moment, that has been threaded and has a combination FN muzzle device on it. Uh, eventually by the end when they were making new barrels, uh, or buying new barrels, they stopped bothering to put on the bayonet lug, and so you'll find the late ones that have just uh, a smooth barrel with a combination muzzle device on it. Now this bayonet lug fits the early style, early pattern of FN bayonet, which is really kind of cool in that it functions as a flash hider. Uh, the blade itself is the bottom of three prongs, and then there are two prongs on the top of the bayonet. So our retaining lug is back here, you pull it down, and you can then you can see that the catch right there, but it does one thing more than that. Now one of the problems of mounting a bayonet on a rifle is that it will change your point of impact. FN made an attempt at, at uh, preventing that by allowing this bayonet to actually move on the rifle under recoil. So the way the catch is set up, the whole bayonet can actually cycle forward about a quarter of an inch when you fire, and the idea is that uh, the rifle will, the inertia, will hold the bayonet forward, the rifle will recoil, and by the time the, the harmonics have had a chance to really make any impact, the barrel will, all, the bullet will have already left the muzzle and it won't change your point of impact. Um, now when I went out shooting, uh, it didn't quite do that, instead, well, here you look for yourself. Bayonets always fall off of rifles when I shoot them. It's possible I just didn't have this attached firmly enough, or I just historically have a bad track record of bayonets falling off rifles when I'm attempting to shoot them. So taking the bayonet, bayonet off simply requires pulling down on this lug and then, then it'll come off. But I really, this is a cool bayonet style with uh, these two flash hider prongs. They would eventually give this up. Um, this is a type 1 
FN bayonet by the time they went to the combination muzzle device. Uh, of course then this bayonet no longer fits, and so they had a different style of bayonet that was much simplified and much cheaper. Over the long term, the FAL really wasn't that great of a match for the IDF. Uh, it was certainly an excellent option when it was adopted in the mid-50s, but by the mid-70s problems had started to come to light with it. So it's a relatively long and heavy rifle, and that would of course be an issue for guys who are in vehicles, helicopters, uh, jeeps, armored fighting vehicles. It's, it's an awkward gun to use in close confines. Um, a lot of people talk about the FAL having reliability problems in, sand, in, in conditions with loose and blowing sand, and while there's some truth to that, I think more of the issue was simply one of maintenance, and a lot of the IDF wasn't that great on weapons maintenance. The IDF was really this sort of widespread uh, civilian militia sort of military, uh, universal conscription, and the FAL is a rifle that's honestly a little better better set up uh, for a professional long-term military style of force. So you have elements like the adjustable gas system, which has a myriad of adjustment options to it, and that's great if you want to tune it in to your specific ammo and get it, you know, minimize the recoil, you can, you can tinker with it. So it it's got just enough gas to cycle reliably, but not any more than that, so the recoil is minimized as much as possible. That's a great thing until you issue a bunch of these rifles out to people who aren't that concerned, and maybe they're not spending a long time with, with the rifle in the military. They're going to hand it back, and they people tweak with that gas system. And then you have problems, and then you have to go back and retune the gas systems. Uh, what the Israelis found was that their rifles didn't work that well with mediocre maintenance. And there were other rifles out there, like the AKs, that they were capturing from all of their Arab neighbors uh, that they were fighting. Those AKs did a lot better with minimal maintenance. There is no adjustable gas system on an AK. You can't mess it up. It's just overgassed from the factory. It is what it is, and it just it's got enough gas that it will work under pretty much any conditions. And that was a, a characteristic that the Israelis liked, and that is in large part what led them to develop the Galil rifle from the Kalashnikovs that they were capturing uh, from their neighbors. So uh, for that reason you'll see the FAL, re it actually remains in service in Israel into the 80s or so, but it would be overtaken and replaced by the Galil. If you want to get one of these yourselves, of course DSA has just released them in two different configurations. Uh, they have, they're, I think they're calling them the enlisted version and the officer's version, which has nothing to do with actual use in the IDF. Uh, they have one, which is this one, this is the, what they call the enlisted version, uh, because it is basically a parts kit in as they received it condition. So the finish is scuffed up, it is, it's just like it came out of the IDF, which I think is really cool. I am going to be uh, taking this out and shooting it extensively, and I don't really want the you know a brand new super nice finish that I am inevitably just going to scratch up. So they've got that version, and this has the early pattern of uh, barrel and bayonet lug. They then also have their what they call their officer's pattern, which is basically the same type of gun, but it has been refinished, it has been duracoated, it has nicer furniture on it, uh, and those actually have the FN style combination muzzle device. Um, as I said earlier. There was a progression of these, of actually three different patterns of muzzle on the Israeli guns, with this being the first, uh, and then the combination device being the late version, and an intermediate transitional type where they actually had both. They would have added a combo device, but why bother to take off the bayonet lug? So uh, both of those are out there as of the time of this filming. DSA is charging $1400 for this version, and $1500 for the refinished slightly nicer looking version. Um, you can check them out at dsarms.com, and uh, hopefully if you get one you'll enjoy it. It's a pretty cool example of a very really pretty scarce and interesting historical battle rifle. Thanks for watching!